Stephen Braitman is an accredited senior appraiser and member of the American Society of Appraisers, active in the Northern California chapter. He is also a member of the Association of Recorded Sound Collections and the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives. Mr. Braitman has been involved with records and music most of his life. His widely acknowledged expertise in the marketplace makes his appraisal service an important component of estate planning, court and arbitration expert testimony, and insurance coverage and claims. His notable appraisal and donation assignments include Michael Jackson property at the Neverland Ranch, Elton John personal record collection, Third Man Records Archive Nashville, Grammy Museum of Los Angeles, the University of Las Vegas, and Archive of Contemporary Music, New York, and many more. Mr. Braitman may be reached at 415-897-6999 or braitman at mindspring.com. His website, which has numerous articles and resources, is musicappraisals.com. Hello, this is Stephen Braitman. I am a music appraiser. I am affiliated with the American Society of Appraisers, and I am a accredited senior appraiser with that association. And as far as I know, I am still the only accredited appraiser specializing in music memorabilia and records in the country. That's strange to me, since I think this is a field that has lots of opportunities for uh, appraising and for lawyers and litigious situations, as we'll find out later in this presentation. But after 10 years of doing this, I'm surprised that no one else has taken, the, uh, taken up the reins to do the same sort of work that I've been doing and having great fun doing it. So without further ado, let's begin and see what this is all about. So I hope by the end of this presentation, you'll take away a few things that could be of value to you in your practice. I hope that you'll have some inkling of how to perceive the potential of a music collection when you're confronted with it as part of an estate, perhaps, or as part of a body of, of contentious materials. Uh, there are hidden assets that I hope you can uncover with some of the tools I hope to give you. And uh, you'll get to know some of the issues that arise between collectors and essentially everyone else. Because collectors being what they are, uh, they tend to run into conflicts with, with buyers, with sellers, with other collectors, with auction houses, with spouses. And I also hope uh, to give you some ideas on what to look for in terms of specific kinds of records and memorabilia that should be red flags for you that are worth pursuing more information about. Okay, so let's start and look here and ask this question. What is worth fighting for? If you saw some of these things, would you consider them worth fighting for? A diamond ring. A diamond ring, yes, yes. A diamond ring could be very valuable depending on the, the size of the diamonds, how many diamonds, the carrots, the quality, the gloss, etc. So I would answer in the affirmative that yes, a diamond ring is often worth fighting for. How about an automobile? An automobile could be a junker. It could be a, a antique classic. It could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. It could be worth 50 bucks. Generally a car, can be worth fighting over in certain circumstances. It is an expensive uh, item for a lot of people, particularly in families. How about a puppy dog? Well, you know, you, you can't buy love, but uh, you can certainly buy animals and pets that bring a lot of love. And uh, yes, a lot of people do fight over their pets, uh, just like they fight over their children. Now let's take a look at this. What about this? I think this is worth fighting over. This is an old 45, an old record. And, uh, you know, it, as you can see, there's a little wear on it. Doesn't look like it's in the best condition. You think this is worth fighting over? You think it has been fought over? Well, consider that this 
particular 45 is the most expensive 45 that's ever been sold in auction. About $34,000 it sold for, and that was several years ago, and it probably would sell for now more. The reason for this particular 45 being so expensive is has an interesting history. The uh, issue I'm bringing to your account is that there are lots of records like this that most people are not aware of that can be very, very expensive. In this case, Frank Wilson, the singer on this record, was a house producer for Motown Records, and he wanted to have his own performing career. So he convinced them to allow him to have a recording session. He recorded this song, Do I Love You, Indeed I Do, and it was released just a few copies were made as a promo, a promotional copy that were distributed to a few DJs. But what happened ultimately was the owner of Motown, Motown Records decided, you know, it's going to be best for you to remain behind the scene to be a producer. I don't want you to be a performing star. So they recalled this single and there are really only about two copies that known to exist in the world. Now, why was this discovered at all? And why is it of interest and became so valuable? Certainly there's other rare, rare records and rare items in the world, but why this one? Well, it just so happens that in Northern England in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a very, very intense DJ scene of dance music of people playing unknown soul singles, up-tempo dance-oriented songs that no one else had ever heard of. One DJ happened to discover this record and it became a huge hit on the dance floor. And when everyone started knowing about this record, particular collectors went looking for it and nobody could find it. And then the story became uh, almost historical you know, among collectors. And when one copy did come on the market, it became the highest selling 45 of all time. So that's just an example that you can't really ignore things that you're not aware of because they may be gold. It's a very highly emotional field, record collecting, music collecting. And I want to just describe some of the opportunities that there might be for you to deal with this field. So let's take cases of divorce. You know, the, the wife usually doesn't know what the husband is doing in his or her room, you know, in the closet or in the basement. So it, it goes to say that what the wife doesn't know, the insurance company doesn't know, the estate doesn't know, the lawyer doesn't know. Most, most people let the record collector alone and that's what they do. They have that stuff, no one cares. Another issue, property settlement. So dad wanted me to have that Beatles record. No, I want that Beatles record. No, I want that album. You want that album. No, that's a great poster, you know, but I've always wanted that poster. So in estate and property settlement issues, you're always finding contentious issues that are related to music memorabilia. And that happens all the time. Uh, you know, people, one person's junk is another person's treasure, right? And oftentimes you'll find one person knows the value of things and will try to discount it and say, oh, that's just, a, that's just junk. You don't need that. Let's throw it away. Well, I'll just take it away for you. So that's another area where there's a lot of litigation that occurs. And then among buyers and sellers, you know, there's always going to be contentious issues between buyers and sellers of any kind. You know, one might say, oh, you said this record was brand new and mint shape. It's not. You said this record was authentic. It was a first pressing, the real thing. It's not. You said I could buy it for this amount of money. Why are you charging me this amount of money? So those are all kinds of issues that occur around music memorabilia that you may get involved with. So obviously the legal issues abound here. So litigation results uh, from contested issues from discovery of these hidden assets when people realize that oh this isn't just my husband's hobby this is a major investment this is like worth more than our house uh, or insurance companies renege on their agreement to pay full replacement value on very expensive items because they're just poo-pooing that oh this is just a, a record or this is just a little poster this isn't worth anything there's also tax issues. 
that become uh, subject to litigation when donations are claimed to be worth X value, but the IRS is saying it's really just Y value, or the donor says one thing and the recipient organization says another. And similarly, in estates, there's always issues where uh, a, 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 there's contested settlements about who owns what, who gets this, who gets that, why, because this is worth something, that's not worth something. So you get all the stuff not worth anything, you get all the stuff that is worth something, but oh, but all those records, really? So anyway, to make a, a long story very short right now, there's a lot of issues that music memorabilia brings to the forefront with in litigious situations. So let's talk a little bit about what is a music appraiser. Now you certainly know what an appraiser is. The appraiser deals with valuation issues, uh, appraising houses, appraising businesses, appraising fine art. But a music appraiser, which of which I am the one right now, is someone who specializes in music related materials. And when I tell people that, they often say, oh, you praise records, right? Yes, well, not just records. And we'll get into all the rainbow of materials that fall under the umbrella of music memorabilia. I am someone who is accredited in appraisal methodology. In other words, I have been formally accredited by an appraisal organization to practice appraisals in this area uh, with, a, with special training and, and certification. And I'm also someone who can produce a document of my valuation research that follows a specific methodology that meets certain legal and ethical standards. And we'll get into what the, some of those legal and ethical standards are a bit later. Here's some ways that an appraiser can help you. So what we do is we provide different kinds of value that are credible through our research and our supporting documentation. There's certain kinds of value that we, we work with. We work with fair market value, we work with replacement value, and we work with liquidation value. And this is the kinds of value that you see for all sorts of contested property, as well as formal reviews of previous appraisals. We provide support for property settlement litigation in cases of divorce, where there's been damage and loss claims for various kinds of lawsuits. We can consult on valuation and very specific characteristics that are critical to valuing various types of music me memorabilia. It doesn't necessarily rise to the full uh, uh, purpose of a, an appraisal, but I can certainly advise on telling you what's what about what and where to find what you need to find for information. Uh, similarly, I can do the, the background research necessary to establish provenance of things, to establish the specific addition issues of, of anything, of other criteria that are needed to, dis, to support defensible arguments to value, okay? I can also provide professional prepared expert testimony as needed in depositions and court appearances and other legal forums. And I should mention that my value estimates in my appraisals are supported with a solid defense in cross-examination. I'm prepared to make any kind of argument I need to make to support the value conclusions in my appraisal. So let's start looking into some details here. The first word I wanna give you is caution or careful or be prepared. In other words, never underestimate the worth of anything until you know. Uh, classic case are comic books. That's why I've put some images here on the slide. Comic books were considered worthless. You read them, you threw them away. Maybe you saved them, you put them in a box in the closet and guess what? Your mom threw them out when you went to college, right? For so many years, comics were one of the lowest of the low in terms of how valuable they were. They came out each month, you bought several a month, you read them, and you went on to the next one. Well, as we all know, comic books are now some of the most valuable collectibles of any kind. And the reason for that is people ignored them. People did not 
expect them to become rare and expect them to become desirable. So again, this is my caution. Don't underestimate the worth of anything. There are financial and legal effects to doing that, that go well beyond uh, you know, any particular item you're talking about. So in, in that regards, let's talk broadly about the situation with music memorabilia. In general, prices are going up and the prestige of the field as a hobby or as a collecting or investment field is, is becoming very solid, okay? Uh, one result of the internet explosion is that it's easier now than ever to know what is rare and what is not. And so collectors are savvy enough to know what true rarity and true values are. And, and consequently, the rarest of the rare, the most valuable items uh, tend to, to become well known and, and everyone is getting in on the game in that sense. Okay. In other words, now that we know a little bit better about what's rare and what's not, we have a large body of collectors who are specifically going out for those rare things that they never knew were rare in the first place. So that's one reason why prices are going up. Even though a record might have sold for 20 years for $2, the fact that no one knew about that record made the price low. Now everyone knows about it. And they're trying to find it and they can't find it. So the price goes up. So consequently, there's a huge market for collecting and, and investment. Uh, and, and, the, and the number of people who are playing this game is increasing all the time for a couple of factors. Yes, there's old line boomer collectors who grew up with record collections and just kept adding to their collection. But there's also the new collectors, the, the young folks, people in their 20s and 30s who are buying not only new vinyl, but old vinyl. And so we see that this market is growing as a collecting field uh, on both ends. So it's not like a dying field, it's a growing field. Also the major auction houses that drive a lot of these values and drive the publicity that increases value are getting in on the action. You have major auction houses like Sotheby's and Heritage Auctions in Texas, Julian's in Los Angeles that specifically deal with music memorabilia, both records and other objects that are helping to promote this field. Uh, to a certain degree, it's still a Wild West situation. There's a lot of standards that still need to be set, but in general, it's, it's a, a really rich, ripe field right now. It might be good now to at least take a little detour and explain what we're talking about a little bit better. So these are some definitions and some of them might be obvious to you, but some may not be. I just want to help you understand how large this field and varied this field of music memorabilia is. Obviously we start with the classic formats, the LPs and the 45s, the 12 inch records and the records with the little holes, the seven inch records, right? Everyone knows what a record album is. Here's some record albums and here's some 45s. This is what everyone knows about and this is what people think about when they think of music memorabilia. But there's more than that. There are 78s, the old format that originated in the late 19th century. That was the most popular format until the early 50s. We also have eight tracks, the little cartridges you could fit in your car and zoom down the highway. Okay, very popular in the 70s and 80s. We have cassettes, also a portable uh, medium that still enjoys a vogue today. We have the earliest kinds of recorded uh, medium, the Edison cylinders, the very first recording discs from the 1880s and 1890s. These were very popular until at least the mid twenties. And there are a lot of collectors out there looking for these truly antique materials. We also have things called flexi discs. These are thin plastic wobbly discs that usually were distributed free. They were inserted to magazines, sometimes record fan clubs sent them out. They can be very rare and they have unique recordings on them. People collect them. We have a format called the EP, which stands for extended play. These are 
records that are the same size as 45s, they're seven inches, but they don't have a small, a large hole, they have a small hole because they have four songs rather than two songs. And they play at 33 and a third rather than 45. They play at the same speed as an LP, not a 45. On the other side, we have 12 inch singles, same size as LPs, but they only have one song on a side. Sometimes they have two songs on a side, but they're, they're especially format used for a couple of reasons. One, for promotional purposes, record companies would make a 12 inch single of a notable song that they wanted to be a hit for and send it out to DJs and record reviewers or dance producers and DJs would collect, would create special 12 inch singles of dance songs that they could use on their turntables to scratch and mix and change. And yes, a lot of 12 inch singles are very rare dance recordings. I'm also mentioning the CD here because the CD, even though it's, it's value as, a, as the mainstream music medium is rapidly decreasing, people are really moving now to streaming and downloading music. The CD sales are still in the millions, but most people are discounting the CD. But again, going back to my initial caution, there are some very, very valuable CDs in the marketplace and they're collectors of these rarities. So bottom line, essentially any recorded media today or in the past is collectible at some level. Let's look here at expanding the definition of music memorabilia and talking about some, some types of things that could be even worth much more than records. Number one of these are posters and related to them, handbills. Handbills are simply posters of small size, eight and a half by 11 or smaller. Uh, posters pound for pound are worth much more than records. There are posters that are worth tens of thousands of dollars and very, very rare. Obviously things by the Beatles on them, original posters by the Beatles can be very expensive, but everyone's familiar, for example, with the Fillmore and Avalon psychedelic posters of, of the 60s San Francisco. Those are the most famous kind of posters. But indeed, posters go back to the 1920s and 30s and some of the early jazz and R&B and blues posters can be worth $100,000, depending on their, the type they are and their rarity. Similarly, when you move into the modern era, the hot field right now is collecting punk memorabilia. So posters and flyers from the late 70s and early 80s featuring notable punk bands like the Ramones or the Talking Heads can be worth a lot of money now in the, in the market. Just filling out this, this detail here, there are other areas that you may not consider collectible or worth consideration, but they are. Vintage rock t-shirts are becoming very expensive now. Uh, t-shirts that were made in the 70s can bring dozens, if not hundreds of dollars each. And similarly, tour and concert related material, what's called press passes or backstage passes or programs to concerts or tickets to concerts all very collectible. They all have their niche collectors. They all have a real range of prices and some obviously are very expensive. Here's some other kinds of music memorabilia that, that has a rich trove of material to draw upon for collectors. Promotional photographs and press kits put out by record companies to promote their artists. Sometimes it's a black and white photograph Sometimes it's a folder with printed material inside and photographs. It can be a variety of formats, but these are insider materials that the general public never got access to. And thus people who collect particular artists, for example, will look to find the particular promotional photographs and press kits that the record company released by these artists. And some of these are worth a lot of money. And it's also a bunch of little stuff. It's buttons, it's bubblegum cards, it's, it's stickers, bumper stickers. It's anything with a band or artist name on it is collectible and usually is highly collectible. The more obscure it might be. Uh, bubblegum cards, for example, who would think of saving bubblegum cards? But some people did. So the bubblegum cards themselves could be worth a few dollars to a few tens or hundreds of dollars each. But let me give you one ironic thing here. See the, here we have the Elvis bubblegum 
card and the ABBA bubblegum card. Well, what's really valuable about these? Not the cards inside, but the wrappers. Really? The wrappers, because people opened them up, took the cards out and threw the wrappers away. So there's very few wrappers that still exist. <laughs> I know it's an irony, but that's the reality of the marketplace, guys. So there's even more music memorabilia to consider. Record awards. The RIAA is the Record Industry Association of America of awards certain plaques and presentations to musicians, bands, record executives, marketing people, advertising people. These, these official awards for notable sales of, of records. And if a record goes gold, sells a million copies, or platinum sells five million copies or whatever, they often get a record award. Now, these can be very rare and very valuable, but what's happened in the marketplace is that there's a whole new subset of record awards that are really commemorative awards. These look like official awards, but they're really just fancy plaques. They might have a record inside that's gold plated. They might have a little logo. They might have a band photo, but they're really just sold for the retail market and their value is much less than the official awards. Consequently, there's often confusion between the two and sometimes people sell them the commemorative awards as official awards and you get contentious issues there. Another area that's very much subject to content contentious issues are signed instruments, particularly signed guitars. This is a huge business. Uh, musicians have found a very lucrative side business in selling signed instruments. Sometimes they just sell their signature, but they make a, a deals with, with guitar instruments, uh, guitar manufacturers and, and other uh, instrument manufacturers such as drums to sign them and to sell them on the on the collector marketplace. Now what's happened is signature authentication has become a major issue. There's lots of fraud out there and the major signature authentication companies are always busy authenticating uh, signed instruments to prove that they are real or not real and a lot of people are disappointed that they spend so much money on a phony signature. Another considerable area are business documents. Almost every marketing company, publicity company, record company, management company, promotion companies produced many, many kinds of different documents that are very interesting to collectors. Contracts, for example, contract between an artist and their record company, between the artist and their touring company or their management company. Those can be particularly valuable if signed by the artists rather than just the manager. Okay. There are writers that are continuously fascinating. These are writers are documents that musicians put on contracts to play concert tours or events, which give specific instructions on things that they need or want to perform properly. Some of these are make very amusing reading, but they also are very unique insights to the whole performing process. In general, you have bills and receipts and all sorts of co correspondence that can be very valuable. Okay, uh, th these kinds of documents, in fact, are increasingly sought by institutions, by libraries and archives and music museums because of their cultural and historical importance and for the research value that they give into insight about the musician's history and the business of the music industry. And just finally, signatures and autographs, a huge, huge field, a huge field fraught with fraud and lots of, of areas there for, uh, for contentious litigation. So let's talk a little bit more about the appraisal process and, and what makes an appraisal legal. Now, formally, the only legally required appraisal is for real estate appraisers because the individual states have mandated that when you buy and sell a house, you need an appraisal. It's not legally required that you do an appraisal for an estate for example, or for insurance coverage, okay? However, because of history of bad appraisers and bad appraisals and 
questionable ethics, the uh, U.S. Congress years ago uh, asked the appraisal foundation to formulate a set of appraisal standards that could elevate the industry and bring a higher ethical standard to appraisal. And what came out of that was something called USPAP. All appraisers call it USPAP, but what it stands for are the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. This is a document that's revised every few years. The, the latest edition just came out for 2018, good through the end of 2019. Uh, the Appraisal Standards Board of the Appraisal Foundation is tasked with revising and writing this document. And what this document does, it spells out what has to go into an appraisal and how you approach the various aspects that go into an appraisal. What methodology you use to find your values, how you treat your clients, how you treat your documentation. This is a, a standard practice for most accredited appraisers today is to follow the USPAP standards. In fact, the IRS requires appraisals to follow USPAP standards now when they are submitted for donations. So it's becoming increasingly required that these formal kinds of appraisals are required more and more by industry. It's also important that the appraiser be credentialed. Now, it used to be that any expert in a field, or not so expert, could call themselves an appraiser. Now, to be honest, I don't know everything about my field of music memorabilia. I don't know everything about records and posters, etc. But I am a credentialed in appraisal methodology. I've met certain education requirements. I've, I've had experience in various ways that affect my ability to function as an appraiser. I've taken exams, I've had testing, and I'm affiliated with one of the major organizations, the American Society of Appraisers. That's different than, say, a, a dealer in rare records who really knows how valuable 78s are, old blue 78s, and probably knows more about blue 78s than I do. But it's not enough for them to say, well, I know that this record is worth $100. They don't have the credential and education to know how to present that data to justify it, say, in a court of law. It's just one person's opinion. It becomes more than one person's opinion when I can justify my valuation decision by showing the where, what, and why of that. And that's why a credential appraiser is, is the way to go these days. One aspect of being credentialed means that you follow the ethics rule. This is not just a USPAP compliant guideline, but also an association guideline. Most appraisal organizations have ethics that you need to follow in any appraisal that you do. First and foremost, of course, is preserving and promoting the public trust. This goes back to the old ethics scandals of appraisal days when you could sell your appraisal based on the value of what you appraised it like yeah i'll, I'll say your uh, your uh, your car there is worth a hundred thousand dollars and i'll charge you ten percent of the appraised value can't do that anymore you have to comply with uspap that's an ethics rule of my association if i was not associated with the asa and was just independently appraising i may not follow uspap but I want, I, want to be appear, I want to appear completely professional, so I'm going to do what my association says. Consequently, my performance must be impartial, objective, independent. All the standard things that are good about, about being ethical in dealing in the marketplace and dealing in business. But when it comes to appraisal, this is what has to be followed very specifically. And that also affects your fees. As I mentioned, some old line appraisers used to charge a percentage of what the value was. You can't do that anymore. That's not allowed. Uh, 
you have to have a fee structure that's transparent, that's objective, and it's not contingent on the results. In other words, I'm doing this appraisal for X amount of money, and whatever the results are, you have to accept them because that's my objective professional judgment. If you're not happy with the results, I'm sorry about that, but I can't change my results just because you're not happy with it. Now, depending on how happy or unhappy you are with my appraisal judgment, uh, I'm gonna protect your confidentiality as my client, though you may have some other issues out there. Bottom line, the appraisal is basically an argument to value. I have done this research, I've collected this background material, I followed this methodology, I've come to the conclusion that this item or these items have X value, and that bottom line is justified with the way I've gone about doing it. So specifically, when I'm approached by a client to do an appraisal, the first thing I do is assess the scope of work. What is there that I'm gonna be dealing with? And how difficult or easy is it to do the kind of research I need to do? Once I know that, I can issue what I call a letter of agreement to the client. It describes the scope of work, how big a job it's going to be, what I will deliver to meet their needs, whether it's insurance coverage or a state property settlement or a donation. I will describe how I'll go about doing it, what, what methodology I will follow, and my estimate of the time and cost. So that going forward with the appraisal, there's no, no secrets, no hidden costs there. Everyone knows out front what's expected and what will be delivered. So I want to talk a little bit now uh, more about the opportunity that is presented to you uh, in this field. Uh, there's some aspects about it that uh, you need to be a part uh, psychologist and part therapist here. The record collector mentality uh, is usually very insular and very singular. Record collectors tend to be very jealous of their collections. They tend to not be too, uh, uh, too vocal about what they have, except to other record collectors, because then there's a lot of one-upmanship going on. So when when a record collection or music memorabilia collection is part of other materials that are subject to litigation or some sort of contentious issues, it's often not that easy to find out really what is there and what is valuable. And it's really a challenge for the lawyer to understand what they're dealing with and to try to figure out what's really there and what really needs to be considered. Uh, it's often true that in a situation like this, one uh, or more parties may not understand what's in this collection. You know, there's there's so many issues uh, uh, where the wife has contacted me because there's a divorce, and she just knows that her record, the record collection of her husband, is worth a lot of money. So she needs me to do an appraisal, <laughs> uh, but she has no idea what's in there. So. Here's some areas where lawyers can be involved, have been involved, and will be involved in the future. Insurance coverage, a very big area, and in fact, a, a much, much growing area for music memorabilia. More and more collectors, uh, music museums, archives, institutions, schools are getting their collections insured. And the problem, of course, is validating the kinds of value that can be expected for large collections or rare items to ensure that the insurance company will make the proper payment in the event of a claim. The adjusters tend not to be very uh, knowledgeable about music memorabilia and rare records. And obviously they'll try to lowball the value that they pay out uh, for anything. So it's incumbent upon the insured to make sure that they have a USPAP compliant appraisal filed with the insurance company and that they're going to get true replacement cost as detailed in the appraisal. But it's also possible that it won't stop there and lawyers are gonna be involved in helping the claimant, the insured, 
recover the full cost of a loss. It's just uh, the facts of the facts on the ground, as it were. Similarly, more and more valuable collections are being used for loans and for leveraging uh, other kinds of purchases. Uh, if you have a record collection that's been formally appraised for worth a million dollars, say, it, it's probably not that difficult to get, say, a $50,000 loan so you can put a down payment on a, on a house, uh, like art collections. The large collections, valuable collections can be used for collateral for a loan. And often lawyers are used to negotiate these kinds of arrangements particularly if there's contentious issues uh, related to what's the value, what's the payout, et cetera, et cetera. Another issue here is with donations, which has been increasingly uh, contentious uh, since the IRS has a very rigorous requirement uh, in, in what kind of appraisals are used for the donations and also what is being donated and where it's being donated to. So. I've often uh, done in, uh, donation appraisals where it's incumbent upon the donor to make sure that what they are donating is not going to be turned around by the recipient and sold so they can just use the money. The IRS frowns on these turnaround donations where it's not really an appropriate use of the material that's being donated. That's very important. The uh, other other cases can be where IRS uh, denies a donation or downgrades the value of a donation uh, for various reasons, never in the case of a bad appraisal, of course. But lawyers can also assist in making these arguments about uh, the relationship between the donor and the recipient organization uh, to the IRS. So there's a, definitely an opportunity there. Another area that's becoming increasingly litigious is the number of unhappy bidders and unhappy sellers who deal with auction houses who sell music memorabilia. Uh, obviously, whenever large amounts of money are being paid or not being paid, there's uh, an opportunity for lawyers to assist. And uh, I've seen bidders sue auction houses. I've seen auction houses sue bidders. Uh, and every which way. It's definitely a Sioux marathon. Uh, as, as more and more material comes on the market and prices keep rising and more and more people get frustrated because they didn't get what they thought they wanted or they, they were outbid, there's going to be uh, a lot of grief. I want to just talk here briefly about a case I was involved with to just show how complicated this can be. Michael Jackson. Everyone knows Michael Jackson, the now deceased uh, R&B soul dance pop musician, has a very large collection of memorabilia, personal sculptures, uh, objects of art, all sorts of material. When, when uh, his family decided to auction off a large amount of material, a lot of it uh, sculptures that were on the grounds of the Neverland estate, uh, Julian's Auctions of Los Angeles handled this appraise, uh, this uh, auction. The auction occurred a few years ago. There were something like 150 items in the auction. One particular bidder based in Canada uh, was a very big collector and wanted to buy most of the major material, was hoping to be the top bidder in most of the major material to own this stuff so he could take it on a world tour. He was pretty savvy about uh, how Michael Jackson would be popular in places like China and South America, and he wanted to take this material on tour. Anyway, he was the high bidder on about 85 items in this auction. But what happened was the family got cold feet, and in the middle of the auction, before the deadline of the auction, they had Julian's stop the auction and pull the material. So obviously this guy was not happy. He sued the auction house and the Michael Jackson family for the right to purchase this material at 
the current bid price he had before they canceled the auction. Well, it went to court. There were lots of lawyers involved. I was hired by this, this guy, this collector, to do an appraisal of all the material that he bid on to show what its fair market value was. And so it was very interesting to go to the Neverland estate and look at this material. I did my appraisal and then I appeared in court. I was cross-examined uh, on my report, on my value. And it was a very interesting experience for me, uh, a lot of fun. Ultimately though, my appraisal and it, my, my uh, testimony didn't matter at all. The jury awarded the case to Julian's auctions and the Michael Jackson family simply on the basis that it was their material and they could do what they wanted with it. So it didn't matter that uh, he had been on it, that it was even up for auction in the first place. They sided with the family. Anyway, that's just an example I wanted to tell you about where lawyers are becoming increasingly involved in very contentious issues with very high level auction houses, bidders and collectors. So now we move to some real specifics about what you're going to find or try to find in these collections, in these archives, in these closets, on these shelves, in these estates, whenever uh, you're asked to look upon them. So this is a kind of a quick guide of some major things that can be helpful to you to know about to know whether a collection, the material you're looking at is really worth fighting over, okay? So again, this is just, this is kind of a superficial overview of some of the hot items in the collecting field. And it's not all of them. And there's obviously ex exceptions to everything, but I just wanted to go through some of these to give you a heads up, okay? It's, this is an alphabetical list, I think. Maybe it's not. Um, so, in terms of records, one thing to look for would be audiophile pressings, special editions, rare editions that were pressed on high quality vinyl in very limited quantities that audiophiles love the sound for. Those were expensive to begin with and their prices have just gone up since, since they went out of print. Briefly, when we come to classical music, there's only a couple categories that are really worth considering since most classical music on vinyl tends to be relatively low value. But if it's avant-garde music, if it's electronic music, if it's the weird music of the 20th century that is hard to listen to, that could be very rare and valuable. Similarly, old monaural pre-stereo records from the 1950s performed by string quartets can be very valuable. Now, the odd thing is that they're in monaural, they're not stereo, they're old pressings, but why would someone be interested in them? Well, the technology of that day in, in recording four instruments around one microphone attained a high degree of pristine quality. The engineering often was superb. So there are collectors out there who strictly look for manoral 50s pressings of string quartets, you know, performing Beethoven or Haydn or, or modern composers because the sound quality is exceptional. Now, when we get to rock music, there's things like bootleg records can be very rare and valuable because they were produced uh, you know, under the counter, usually in the 70s and 80s. Now they're rare and the music on them still is generally unavailable. You get garage music and psychedelic music from the 60s. Small labels put out hundreds of bands that never sold any copies and now they're all very rare and valuable. And one other area I want to talk to you about is soul and funk music from the late 60s and early 70s. This goes back to our Frank Wilson 45 at the beginning of this presentation. There were lots of, lots of music put out in that period of time, but most of it didn't become a hit. So now these DJs in North of England and throughout the world and record collector are looking for all of these records that exist in very few quantities 
of soul music that wasn't a hit and the prices are amazing that probably in general this is the the most expensive field of 45 collecting old soul and funk 45s you know uh, an average 45 selling for three four five hundred dollars uh, is pretty typical and that's that's often in the low end of the prices also similarly we're talking jazz music jazz of the 50s and 60s on original pressings can be very very valuable old movie soundtracks but not just any movie soundtracks we're talking about soundtracks from the 50s and 60s generally um, punk music punk music is having a vogue now some of the records released in the late 70s are attaining new values every day one one time you'll see an auction end for a rare punk record that came out in 1978 and the album sells for fifty dollars next time it sells for 150 dollars then it'll sell for three hundred dollars so the the field is rapidly expanding in that field um, i'll just say one more thing uh, about things to look for here you can look at this slide on your own and ask questions but when it comes to classical records the best thing to do is to locate RCA Living Stereo, London Blueback, and Mercury Living Presence records. These are late 50s, early 60s classical records, the early, earliest stereo recordings. They can become very valuable if they're original pressings. And finally, I want to come back to 78s. 78s, you find a lot of 78s on the market. People are always contacting me about their collection of 78s, usually that their parents or their grandparents had. Well, most 78s are worthless or near worthless. Why is that? Because before the LP and the 45, that's the way people bought records. And they bought as many records then as they bought now. There's millions of 78s out there and the first million selling record was by Enrico Caruso in 1905 or somewhere around that so they're still common even though they're 100 years old or more and they're also not valuable because most of the music on them no one cares about anymore we're talking big band music swing era music pop vocalists opera early pop vocalists, novelty tunes, etc. This is all music that no one really cares about today. The collectors of that music have what they have already, and it's still all relatively common. However, <laughs> there's always a however. Some of the most valuable records of any kind are found on 78. And as expected, these are in the genres that did not sell in large quantities, that were marketed to very small audiences, that were put on by small labels perhaps, that they're just incredibly rare. And you can guess some of these genres, blues, early, early jazz music, ethnic music, you know, rhythm and blues, original rock and, bo rock and roll records, you know, some uh, English classical music titles, these things, are often so rare, there are blues records that people know there's only one or two copies in existence. Uh, and they can be worth tens of thousands of dollars. So that's about 78s, and we're moving on. What do you not look for? You walk into a room and immediately you spot this stuff and you can say to yourself, okay, I'm not gonna bother with it because I know what it is already. What does that mean? Well, it means you've seen a collection, it's all big band and swing era music, right? Albums, 45s, 78s, who cares? They're all classical music LPs, but it's all Mozart and Beethoven, and Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff. It's all the standard stuff everyone's heard millions of times. There's thousands of recordings of the same kind of music. No one cares. Comedy. Now, comedy is very, very popular, but no one really cares about it at a collector level. For someone who collects comedy records like myself, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, the, Wild West because I could find tons of rare things really cheap, but if you see a large comedy collection, I'd pass it by. Mainstream rock, mainstream rock from the 70s and 80s, we're talking Bruce Springsteen, you know, Talking Heads, uh, uh, Bon Jovi, Fleetwood Mac, uh, Deep Purple, all of this stuff sold millions of copies. 
the 70s and 80s were the high water mark of the LP production. And most of this stuff is all very common and no one cares about it anymore on LP. There are exceptions. I'm generalizing, but if that's what you see in this collection, you don't need to spend much time on there. Similarly, musicals, Hollywood musicals, Broadway musicals, pass it by. And finally, what we might call our parents' music, the pre-rock and roll pop vocalists of the late 40s and the 50s, your Frank Sinatra, your Peggy Lee, your, your Dean Martin, you know, Julie London. These are great music, perhaps, but not collectible, common, and who cares? Pass it by. So we've come this far about the kinds of music to look for, what not to look for, what it means to appraise things, what it means not to know what you don't know because you should know and how it's contentious or not contentious and what some of the issues are. But let's look at a real case scenario here about why it's important to evaluate things and, and the consequences of that. Here we have a Beatles record. Now, you may or may not be familiar with this Beatles record, but it is a huge selling, you know, tens of millions of copies of records in the, in 1964, 65. It, it's a, a record called Introducing the Beatles. It's essentially the very first Beatles album. And what we have here are three versions of it. Now, you may not know about this record, but if you see this record, you need to look at it a little closer than than other Beatles records, because it might mean something. For example, this record here, in really nice mint condition, you could find this selling for over uh, almost a thousand dollars, if not more. You'll notice it has uh, the back cover has uh, the songs listed on the back cover. However, if it's this version of the record without anything on the back cover, it often sells for $3,000 or more. It's called the blank back version. It sounds good, right? Well, if it's this one, it has a bunch of ads on the back of other records. This is sold for well over $11,000 in really good condition. It is a very, very rare record. Now, the story behind why there's three variations to this record is interesting in itself, but it points up that the details often matter when it comes to evaluating music memorabilia. In this particular case, the record company, VJ Records, rushed out this record when the Beatles first appeared on Ed Sullivan and there was suddenly Beatlemania exploding in America. They put out this record, the very first version with the ads on the back because they didn't have any other information. They got it out within a week and was selling copies, but then they got the, the information they needed to create the back cover. But in the meantime, before they could do the mock-up, they ran out of copies with the ads. So they just put out copies with nothing on the back cover. And then eventually they did put out a copy that had the song titles on the back. Now, the story is even more complicated than that. Uh, but I want to tell you also that this is the most counterfeited record in history. Most copies that you will find are not going to be real. They're going to be counterfeit. And there's many ways to tell the counterfeit from the real. Uh, the most telling is if you'll look on the front cover, you'll see a slight shadow on the wall to the right of George Harrison. Most counterfeits do not have that shadow. Anyway, I just wanted to give you an example of something that reveals itself with, with closer examination. And it goes back to knowing what you're looking at uh, and how and the, the price of ignorance may be too pr large a price to pay. So let's just talk briefly about the future. There is a future. There is going to be a future. The rarest, most expensive items will continue to get rare and more expensive. The knowledge about what is rare and what is not rare only becomes increasingly more sophisticated with the new tools available on the internet and the, the one world aspect of record collecting. It used to be 
that record collecting was a very geographically specific area. What was rare in one city was not rare in another. Now, with many platforms that offer record collectors an international forum, there's nothing rare. If something is rare in one city, it's rare in every city. If something common in one city, it's common everywhere in the world. So the, the, the market is exploding because knowledge is exploding. And in terms of the future, because of this, there's always going to be disagreements over value, over the transactions, the way people get their records and their music memorabilia, over the condition. They'll never agree on whether this is mint or very good or fair or poor. That's always going to be subject to disagreement. And over ownership, who gets what? Is this mine or yours? No, he said it was mine. No, he said it was yours. So, so these are general areas in which I expect to see more and more litigation uh, brought to the fore and it's something you should be aware of. So thank you for putting up with me through this. I hope you've learned something I hope it was interesting enough. I'm always available for questions and for assistance. Uh, this was fun for me. I hope it wasn't too, uh, too grueling for you. And uh, we'll talk another time. Thanks very much. And remember, good listening.